going live. Facebook Live. Yeah! <laughs> hey everybody, it's Allie, the canine nutritionist from Padfoot Palms Poodles and Pals, and we are doing a Facebook Live today, which we have not done in quite some time, and Kennedy is very excited about it, right Kennedy? Okay. She made me get excited in here, and she was like, hey, I don't want to miss out on something. I love you. Thank you. You're a good girl. Okay, off. Good girl. Okay, go lay down and relax. They were running around outside, so they're all hot and pant right now. They're panty. Panting dogs. Go lay down. Good girl. Go lay down. Okay, so anyway, I just hopped on here a few minutes early. I'm just kind of stalling, giving people a chance to jump on with the live session. So while I am stalling, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about some of the topics that I wanted to cover today. And if you're wondering what that glare is on my glasses, it's just because I've got um, the Facebook group pulled up here on my computer because I made a post where people could post their questions. So just in case there's any questions there, I want to grab those. Okay, so let's start off with our first topic, which is pumpkin. Now, every year, this time of year, it's, it's that time, um, we go through this phase where everybody's making pumpkin pies, pumpkin spice this, pumpkin that, pumpkin bread, pumpkin everything, right? And so pumpkin can become hard to come by, um, especially if you are a savvy shopper and you're not purchasing the pumpkin digestive aid right from the, the dog pet store. Um, you know, get your pumpkin from your local, local grocery store. So anyway, the point of saying all of this was to say that it is that time of year that pumpkin becomes scarce, right? Because everybody's using it to cook with, whereas normally you can get it at the grocery store and you're fine. So I wanted to mention that there are a couple of options for people, and I see that we've had a couple of people join. I'm so glad you guys are here. If somebody would do me a favor and drop me a comment down in the comments section just so that I know it's working in case there are any questions, I can answer them for you guys. And as always, if you have a question, make sure you put it in the comments because I take breaks in between talking and answer your questions. So, um, back to pumpkin. Hey, Caitlin said, hey, hello, Caitlin. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so you have a couple of options when it comes to pumpkin, so don't panic even though it's pumpkin spice everything time of year, um, you have some options. You can purchase an actual pumpkin, <laughs> right? Which is like a squash or a gourd, and you cook it very similarly. Um, just keep in mind that if you try to cook it and then freeze it, that they don't thaw very well. There's something about pumpkins that they just don't do well. Hey, Joyce said hi, hello! So um, try to get something in the size range that you know that you'll use, right? Um, it stays good in the fridge for roughly a week, depending on you know, your, your cooking process as far as a pumpkin goes. Now, if you wanna eliminate all of that hassle, you can just go to Amazon and order pumpkin powder. And this is actually something that I like to keep on hand um, I also like to keep the canned pumpkin on hand, but uh, if for whatever reason you run out of pumpkin or, you know, you can't get a hold of any or you have an urgent need, right, a dog that has explosive diarrhea and you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta get him a pumpkin immediately, then um, the, the powdered pumpkin can really be a lifesaver. So uh, you can reconstitute the powder either with warm water or you can use it just as a powder. Personally, I feel like the dogs eat it better if you mix it with a little bit of warm water and kind of turn it into a, a pumpkin paste, if you will. 
So yeah, um, just be careful when you're searching on Amazon because there are going to be a lot of options that pop up for pumpkin seed powder and that is not the same thing. So just double check what it is that you're looking at online and that should help. Okay, great. So that was pumpkin. Awesome. Okay, we've got more people joining. Hello! Just don't forget, or if you're new here, if you have a question, drop it down in the comments section below and I'll be sure to answer your question for you. If you don't ask questions, then I'm just going to continue to ramble because that's what I do. That's me. <laughs> okay. So, next on our list, I wanted to talk about raw meaty bones. So, here let me let me lock the screen there so it's not quite so so bright on my face. It's got that got the glare going on. Okay, that helped a little bit. All right, so raw meaty bones. We're seeing a lot of questions about raw meaty bones in the group, which I cannot tell you how excited I am that people are either looking into or are giving their dogs raw meaty bones. It's fantastic. It is the best natural toothbrush that you can use for your dog. I mean, it's they, they do a phenomenal job of really getting that plaque and tartar off of your dog's teeth um, and keeping it off. So. There are just a few things that you want to keep in mind with raw meaty bones. And um, don't forget that we have two files, uh, two documents in the file section of the group. One of them is healthy bones and chews, and the other one is bones. Um, and each of them give you recommended options based on your dog's size, right? Or how aggressively they chew. So that can kind of help you get started if you're new to doing raw meaty bones. But there was a couple of things that I wanted to point out just so people have a reference. Um, machine cut bones that you can get from your butcher or the grocery store are incredibly cheap and they are really good for making bone broth and that's it. I do not recommend that people give their dogs machine cut bones, regardless of whatever the bone is that's been cut, what type of bone it is. Hey, we got more people joining, hello! Um, machine cut bones have sharp corners that can stab your dog in the gum. Um, they also have slender pieces that as your dog is chewing can break off and either become sharp or become a problem when your dog swallows them. The, the whole thing about machine cut bones is there is just way, way too many risk factors and I really just don't recommend them. So while they're very cheap and people wanna jump on board with feeding raw meaty bones, it's very important that you keep in mind that machine cut bones should be used for bone broth only. Brandy says, howdy, hello. So um, that's the thing about machine cut bones. Like they're super cheap. They're phenomenal for bone broth. By the way, if you're looking for um, a video to show you how to make bone broth, just a very simple, easy um, stovetop bone broth, I have a video on my YouTube channel that shows you how to do that. Sarah says, hi there, well, hello. So, yeah, so just avoid the machine cut bones if you can. Um, in addition, if you are looking at bones in the grocery store, you need to be very, very careful that they're not smoked or basted or um, oven, oven roasted. I I've seen it called a million different things, but just keep in mind that all of those marketing terms mean that the bones have been cooked. I understand that there is this loophole in which companies are allowed to advertise those as being safe for pets. They're not. 
Do not ever give your dog cooked bones, ever. Never, ever, ever, okay? It's very hard for them to be digested. They can collect in the digestive system. It's, it's really bad. Lilium says, my broths are a disgrace. Oh no! Well, you'll have to tell me what it is that, that's going wrong for you. Maybe I can help you out. I know that sometimes people have a hard time getting them to get to that kind of jello consistency, right? Where they're kind of jiggly. Um, so anyway, let me know. Lilium, let me know. Maybe I can help you out. Okay, so no machine cut bones. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is a lot of people ask about um, other dental cleaning products like the additives that you can put into water and um, various toothpastes and treats, right? All of those things that claim that they're going to take the tartar off of your teeth. And I just want to put something in perspective for you. If there was a product on the market that was so easy that all you had to do was add it into your water and it would remove tartar and plaque from your teeth, don't you think that dentists would be charging an arm and a leg to sell that to us? Right? It's because it doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. It doesn't work. No. Now, if you're feeding a kibble diet, or you choose to feed a kibble diet, which is perfectly fine, um, you have to understand that there are certain health concerns that go with that. And one of them is if you're going to feed kibble, then you're going to have to do something for dental care because despite the um, myth that kibble cleans teeth, because it doesn't, um, you know, you are going to have all kinds of tartar buildup from the starches and sugars that are in kibble. So how do you offset that? Well, raw meaty bones is your best option by far. I mean, it is the most effective. It can actually take a dog who has plaque and tartar buildup and remove it. Now, that's if you're giving a raw meaty bone every day, um, you know, and, and you're staying on top of it. But ideally, you don't want them to get to that point, right? So you can incorporate, even if you're feeding kibble, you can incorporate a raw meaty bone into their diet, maybe not every day, maybe you alternate it with some other chews, right? But you can keep their teeth healthy and clean and their gums as well and the other thing that you want to remember about raw meaty bones is it's not just about mouth health which is very important right we'll all agree on that it's about mental stimulation and this is what people forget when you give your dog a chicken neck let's say you have a Pomeranian and you're giving them a chicken neck every three days to maintain their, you know, their teeth and their gums. When you give them that chicken nut neck and they're chewing it, they're trying to pull the meat off of the bone, they're actually chewing the bones, right? All of that is mental stimulation for the dog. That's fantastic. And it's one of the ways that people tend to forget that they can provide that kind of mental exercise for their dogs is by giving them something to chew, right? It's a natural stress reliever. So if you have a dog that is um, very high anxiety or is dealing with a recent trauma, giving them something to focus on, like a raw meaty bone, can be very helpful. And it can help to um, move their mind into a healthier state of mind because it gives them that focus, right? And they're chewing, right? And then you've got the added benefit that it's good for their teeth. Okay, so it looks like we've got a couple questions here. So hang on a second. Lilium says, had a friend that rubbed coconut oil with a washcloth on teeth and it was miraculous. Yes, yeah, you can do that. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things where 
you can either commit yourself to brushing your dog's teeth every single day, which in all of my years, I have only ever met one person who actually did that. One. So you, you can be that person if that's the route you wanna go. If you wanna brush your dog's teeth, absolutely. Um, and coconut oil does have a lot of positives as far as um, you know dealing with bacterias and fungus and things like that. So if the dog is starting out with clean teeth or they've just got you know very very minimal when it comes to maybe a little bit of tartar buildup, um, no plaque, then yeah, coconut oil absolutely. If you're brushing your dog's teeth by the way side note um, people always ask me what's the best doggy toothbrush and it's the one that it's like the little sleeve that goes over your finger it works so much better than like the actual one that looks like a human toothbrush so and I find that dogs um, you can feel how much pressure you're putting on them right because just like you don't want somebody like you know in your mouth they don't want it either so that way with when when it's on your finger you can feel how much pressure you're actually applying to their gum and to their tooth so but yeah coconut oil is definitely good okay Allie I know this group uses vets best toothpaste how do you feel about that so if I remember correctly, the Vets Best toothpaste has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look it up to see what the ingredients are. The problem with a lot of the toothpaste that are on the market and the dental chews, um, like those ones you can buy at the vet that just have, they're just full of chemicals. The problem with those is it doesn't do you any good if you're not brushing your dog's teeth every day, right? Just like we have to brush our teeth every day. So if you're brushing their teeth every day, which let's be honest, who, who's going to remember to do that? Um, and you're, you have all those chemicals on top of that, right? It's kind of like, meh. Because keep in mind, the dogs are swallowing it, right? It's not like with people where we're brushing our teeth and then spitting it out. The dogs are actually swallowing whatever toothpaste you're using. So that's why I highly recommend if you're going to use a toothpaste that you use something that's all natural. But yeah, I'd have to look up the Vets Best to see what ingredients are in there. Um, I know if you do a search in the group for toothpaste, I believe, I want to say there were two or three people that had posted like a natural toothpaste that had coconut oil and a couple of other things in it, um, and they said that it worked really well. So you might want to check that out. And you can use the little search function. It's just the little um, magnifying glass in the corner on in the Facebook group. Just put in toothpaste and it should show up for you. Okay, all right. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was high ALT in Pomeranians. So this is one of those things that continues to pop up and I just wanted to go over it just in case you happen to have a Pomeranian um, or, or any dog in general, but it's very common in small breeds. So high ALT, is part of a genetic disorder and what ends up happening is that people just have a pomeranian or a small dog as a pet and they take their dog to the vet and they have blood work done usually it's uh, right before a, a spay or a neuter and the vet is concerned because the dog has a high alt level but if you don't have your dog genetically tested, which is usually what breeders do, then you don't know that that's actually the normal level for your dog, right? So unless you're doing blood work yearly, 
you won't know that that's a normal level for your dog. Um, and people have a tendency to panic, uh, especially if they are new breeders and they see it come up on a, um, a genetic panel and they go, oh my gosh, the dog has high ALT, what does that mean? So it just means that when your vet runs that kind of blood work, their levels are going to run in a slightly higher range than what is the average for canines, right? So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you are a breeder or you're a new breeder and it pops up, you know, just like with any genetic disorder, you want to make sure that you're not breeding two dogs that have the same genetic disorder together, right? Um, if you are not a breeder and this happens to you, then it's just something that you want to keep an eye on. Um, if you genetically test your dog and you're not breeding, or you are, and it comes up, you definitely want to make your vet aware because they'll make a note of it in the chart that it's part of a genetic disorder and they won't panic when they see it, when it comes up on the blood work. And it's just something to keep in mind. Um, someone had asked earlier in the Facebook group if it's something that um, there's like a detox regimen for, there isn't, right? Because it's a gen it's part of the genetic makeup of the dog. Um, <coughs> everybody's gonna start barking now. Um, there's certainly quite a few things that you can do to try to boost the dog system overall or boost uh, their liver function in general, which can be helpful. Um, however, it all kind of falls back to the genetics of the dog. So. Um, how well that works for each individual dog is going to vary. So yeah, it's not something that you detox from, right? Like if, you're, if your puppy has adverse reactions to a vaccine, right, and they're not severe adverse reactions, then you can do kind of a detox sequence. Um, so not quite the same thing. So yeah. Okay. Let's see if we've got any more questions. Meg said, thank you, I'll look through the group. Absolutely. Okay, so we've had a few more people join. Hello, thank you for joining us on the Friday Night Live. If you have any questions, make sure you put them down in the comment section below and I will be sure to answer your question. Everybody's barking. Let me see what time it is. Let's see if we got any questions that came up on the Facebook post. Okay, we got a question from Loretta. She said, picky eaters and when do you, and when do you so feeding the satin balls? Okay, Loretta, you lost me there. Picky eaters. And when do you start? Maybe she meant start feeding the satin balls. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, satin balls is a terrible name for a supplemental feeding tool that breeders use. The recipe for the satin balls is in the file section of the group. Basically, it's a combination of protein and carbs and fats that you add in addition to their regular diet um, either to help them put on weight or to maintain their weight so I'm not sure hopefully Loretta will join us and and be able to clarify what she means by for picky eaters so the other thing that I want to mention when it comes to picky eaters, because I get asked about picky eaters a lot, is uh, there is a file, a document in the files for picky eaters. And it's very important that if you have a picky eater, everybody's barking, if you have a picky eater that you read that file before you start messing with their diet. Because what a lot of people do unintentionally is create a picky eater, right? Their dog doesn't eat, maybe they skip a meal and they panic 
And so they decide, oh, okay, well, I'm going to give them chicken and rice, or I'm going to do, you know, beef and pumpkin, or, right? And so then what ends up happening is that you teach your dog that if they just snub their nose at whatever you put down, that you're going to give them something better. And they actually train you. So if you have a picky eater, make sure that you check that out. Maria says, my dogs hear your dogs, and now they're barking. <laughs> Everybody always has that problem when they watch my videos. I'm so sorry. Um, that happens to me all the time, especially when I'm watching videos on YouTube. So here, hang on. Okay. I'll close the door for a minute. Come here. Come here. Gambit. so cute you guys you gotta see him hang on look at that adorable puppy he's so tired gambit hey little good boy he's exhausted everybody was running around playing i was trying to get them tired so they would be good during the live session but as you can see that didn't work out You did have to close the door. Oh, it sounds like Suze is home. Hey, Allison's here. Hello, Allison. They're jumping all over out there. Okay. Well, that was all of the topics that I had to cover today. So if you guys have any questions, make sure you drop them down in the comment section below. Otherwise, I'm going to jump off of here because... We have a lot to do tonight. We're doing a lot of cleaning. I'm gonna be um, driving to go meet up with my dad because we're going to be dog sitting his dog while he's on vacation. So yeah, we got a lot, got a lot going on this weekend. Okay, I'll give everybody just a minute. Let me make sure that we didn't have any other comments on the Facebook page. Okay. What's your advice on this, please? Usually if both dogs are in their crate and I decide to take the older dog outside to potty or something else, the puppy tend to whine and throw a fit. I tried distracting the puppy while I carry the older one outside, but it didn't work. So that's kind of tricky, especially if they're in the same crate. Um, what I would do is try to offer the puppy a distraction that they can't turn down. So, for example, um, we are currently not allowing Gambit outside because he has not completed all of his shots yet. So what I do is when I'm going to take everybody else outside, um, I set a boundary which for me is at the back door because we have a little screened in area and then that leads to the outside. So I set that boundary and I taught him that he can't go past that boundary, right? So if you have, um, you know, for dogs, it can be like the threshold of a doorway or something like that. Um, if you want the puppy to stay in the crate while you take the other dog out, that's definitely going to be, oh, they're in a separate crate. Okay, great. Sorry, I misunderstood. So what I would do is give your puppy something. Um, and it can just be something small like one of those baby carrots, right? So you come in, you're getting the older dog to let them outside to potty. You give your puppy the carrot. Right? So now they're excited about chewing the carrot. They're probably still going to whine a little bit, but now you can take your older dog outside, just ignore the puppy, then come back. But then you want to make sure that you're not letting your puppy out until they calm down. And that's really the key, because if you're coming back in with your older dog and then letting the puppy out and the puppy's been frantically crying, 
then if you're letting them out, then you're teaching them, okay, well, when you freak out, then I let you out. Oh, Valerie said hair is pretty. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't do anything. I, I took a shower. I took a shower just for you guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I would try that. Try um, a carrot, piece of carrot is good. Um, if your dog's like celery, you can use celery. Something that's healthy, right? Don't, don't, don't just be giving your puppy like all sorts of treats, but give them something that they'll be interested in, right? That can distract them. The other thing that you can use that might be helpful is, and I'm drawing a blank because it's in the car. Okay, bear with me for just one second. It looks like, oh, what is it called? Um, hang on, hang on. Don't go anywhere. Yes. Okay. Is this it? I think it's called Groove. Yeah, okay. Diggs Groove Dog Crate Training Tool. And what I'm going to do is flip the screen around so that you can see this. Hang on. Hold, please. Oh, we're getting very close and personal. Okay, hang on. Okay, this. Oh, it's telling me to rotate your phone. Okay. What is happening? All right. Sorry, it's because I've got you on a tripod. So can you see that? And what that is, and I've actually got one. Here, let me show you the name. And this is on Chewy, by the way. Okay, hang on. Spinning around, and we're back. Okay. I probably just made everybody nauseous. I'm so sorry. So, um... What this is, is it's a, a crate training tool and it twists. So you put, um, you know, you can do like some pureed cooked food. You could do some soaked kibble and smash it down on there. And then you put it in the sleeve so it looks like a, um, a popsicle and you put it in the freezer. And then when you're ready to use it, you just pull it out and it twists so that it goes in between the slats of the crate and then you twist it again and it holds it in place. And what it does is it's essentially a lick mat, right? I'm sure you've probably seen those, that attaches to the crate and puppies have to work at it to lick both sides of the treat. And once you have it in hand or you watch my video that I'm gonna do on the one that I purchased, um, it'll give you a better idea of how it works. So you may want to look into purchasing something like that so that, again, you're taking the other dog out. So now you've got your Groove Dog Crate training tool and you pop it on the puppy's crate and then leave, right? So now your puppy has something to do, something to distract them. Um, and if you freeze it, it'll take them a lot longer to kind of work through it. So yeah, I would give that a try and, and see if that helps. Um, but in the meantime, if you're looking into getting something like that, you can do carrots, celery, um, you know, if your dog likes to chew those, some dogs like broccoli, right? Just something that's not like, don't give them a bully stick every time you're taking the other dog out, right? Because those calories add up very quickly. Um, and especially for a puppy, you could unintentionally give them diarrhea, so... Valerie said I'm used to seeing you in a ponytail. Yes, that is how I live my life, definitely. I gave him his favorite toy. It didn't work, right? It's early in the morning and his wine tended to disturb my husband out of his sleep. Okay, so... I guess my question is... If it's early in the morning... And you're taking the other dog out why not take them both out together especially if the puppy's been asleep
the moment that they wake up in the morning, they have to go to the bathroom. Like they're, they're not going to be able to hold it. So you may find that all of the advice that I just gave you may be a moot point. If it's first thing in the morning, your puppy wants out of the crate because they have to potty. You, you just got to take them to go potty. So yeah. Let's see what else we got. While we wait for her to respond. Hey, we got Simon. Hello, Simon. Hi there, how are you? Hey, I'm, uh, I'm doing pretty good. It's been a long week, but you know, I've survived. <laughs> I have a Dotson puppy of five months and I'm always afraid of something happening every time he runs too much and slides, jumps and rolls. Yeah, they do that a lot. With some of the momentum when he's playing with the other dogs he likes at the dog parks, I wonder how much I should monitor his activity at this age and also when he's older it's like I'm treating him like he's glass no not at all um, but that's just what's best for his health his back and bones yes okay so I love that you are concerned especially about his back and bones because that immediately tells me that you are very aware of your breed and some of the issues that they tend to have tend to have if I could talk I would so yeah Simon big thumbs up to you um, you're not treating him like he's made of glass right obviously um, what I would say is at this age about five or six months that they can have about mm, about 20 to 30 minutes of like a hard play session if it's on like even ground right so they're not running up and down hills um, make sure we're not jumping off of furniture or anything low to the ground right um, I am not a fan of dog parks so I would advise against that um, dog parks are a really great place for your puppy to pick up a lot of bad behaviors um, and there are a lot of dogs that play very rough with puppies and a lot of owners that don't understand uh, canine behavior and when a puppy is saying enough is enough because a lot of times sorry my dad's calling me um, they take their puppies to the park or their young dogs, and then they're play, 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 right? Everybody's in a high level of excitement. No one's bad behaviors are being corrected. And what ends up happening is that puppies get overstimulated. And then owners take them home. And now puppies are biting very hard. They're chewing up stuff that they normally wouldn't, right? You'll, you'll see a lot of negative behaviors not to mention that it's a breeding ground for disease so all of that aside if you want to take your dog to the dog park that's your personal choice um, but I, I don't recommend it if you're going to do it for a puppy I would much rather see you have a coordinated puppy play date where maybe you you choose a specific dog park at a specific time and only the people who are coming have puppies that are the same size and age as your puppy that would be much more ideal um, but even then you got to keep your eyes on everybody um, I definitely would not be letting your puppy play with anybody bigger than him which for a Dotson is going to be hard to do just because he's got so much growing to do, right? And they are so prone to joint and back issues that I would hate for an injury at the dog park at five or six months old, right, to then plague him the rest of his life. So, um, yeah, so to just reiterate, I don't feel like you're treating him like glass. I, I feel like you're being a responsible pet owner 
And this is a really great question. So just remember that with puppies, less is more. There's going to be shorter play sessions and then more of them throughout the day. So for example, if you were going to the dog park for an hour, that is like neurological overload to a six month old puppy. I mean, absolute, their little brains are gonna be totally fried by the time you leave there. I mean, they could do maybe 20 or 30 minutes and that's if they had a relatively mellow group of other puppies that are their size. You see what I'm saying? Like, it, there's so many variables. So, yeah, I would definitely um, look into potentially doing some doggy play dates or puppy play dates that are coordinated, smaller size puppies, maybe in an indoor environment um, with carpet, right? Not on like a hardwood floor. That's the other thing you were talking about, about slipping and sliding and right? They get going so fast. Make sure that you have a lot of rugs in your home, rugs or carpeting, or even if they're just temporary or cheap ones because the puppy's going to mess them up, that's okay. Um, making sure that they have good traction is very important for how those joints develop. So I would definitely look into that as well. Okay, Simon posted something else. I read there needs to be a balance of activities and sleep for puppies so it doesn't stunt their growth. Well, I'm not so sure about stunting their growth, but a balance of activities and sleep, absolutely, absolutely. Simon, I am loving you, man. You have done a lot of research. Just wanted to get your take on this. Thanks so much. What do you think about supplements for back joints? Sorry, I asked something similar before in the group. No, that's fine. So um, what I like to use, and I just so happen to have it right here. This is what I use for my dogs. It's the New Joint Plus. The reason why I like this is because it doesn't have any problematic ingredients and it's very easy to give to the dogs and it's safe for puppies so this is going to be a great option if you're just looking to give like a daily joint support so i would highly recommend this now for somebody who had a dog with arthritis or serious joint issues they would want to look into doing um the new joint ds and ds just stands for double strength um, that's the other variety. Let me show you what this looks like. It actually smells pretty good. So, it's just, they call it a wafer, right? It's just a little thing. It kind of smells like, like chicken soup. You know how chicken soup has like that really hearty kind of, anyway. I focus on the wrong thing sometimes, sorry. So anyway, the dogs think it's a treat. And it's it's just, it works great. So um, if you're looking for the link for these, I have the link in the announcements, uh, or I can send it to you if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, this is the 180 tablets. You have a small breed puppy, so you could even get a smaller bottle and that would be perfectly fine. Um, and depending on how much your puppy weighs, you could probably, yeah, you probably do half a wafer. So then the bottle's gonna last you even longer on top of that. So that's what I would recommend. Um, the other thing that you're gonna wanna take into account with your Dotson, and it sounds like you've done a lot of research, um, you wanna make sure that you're keeping them at a healthy weight. If this is your only dog, I highly recommend that you check out the puppy recipes that we have in the file section of the group. Um, feeding a small breed puppy fresh homemade food, whether it's raw or home cooked, um, is really very affordable and it's not hard to do at all. I have quite a few videos that show you how to do it. So 
that may be something that you want to look into. I find that puppies who are raised on fresh food, they tend to have better muscle tone, which is ideal for making sure that those joints are moving properly, right? Because it's not just the joint. Like if you're doing, if you're doing a supplement, right? Okay, we're helping joints. But then you want to kind of attack it from both sides. Okay, now we're supporting joints, but then on the food side, we're going to be building up that muscle structure. We're going to be making sure that our puppies get rest and then they get exercise and right. So it makes a big difference. But yes, I would definitely um, get your puppy started on a joint supplement that's that's like the um, new joint, something that's low dose. It doesn't have to be a huge dose. Okay. Okay, Fell's back. Let's see. I take the puppy out first, then take the older dog out. I don't take both out at once in the morning because they play extremely wild and tend to tangle up in the leash, and I almost fell. Okay, gotcha. I can't let them loose without the leash. I have to keep them on a leash. That's why I don't take them out together. Okay. All right, I understand. Um, I'm trying to think of what would be a good workaround. When you have them on the leash, how long is your leash? Because if you had them on like a four foot leash, right, then you could have one on each side and hold your arms up out, right, like apart, so that they couldn't get tangled because they couldn't go together. I wonder if that would work for you. Um, Yeah, the only other thing that I can think of is take them out together and then let one of them potty while you hold the other one. I don't know how big they are. That could work. But I would I would think about doing a shorter leash. Something that's real, real short. Like just from your hand down to the dog and that's as short as it is. Like it doesn't get any longer than that. If you're using like a retractable leash definitely don't do that or you can do that but have the retractable leash be on the older dog and the, the short leash on the puppy right so that you can have some kind of control but yeah I'm trying to give you some kind of um, advice that would be helpful because trying to take one and then the other especially first thing in the morning when they both have to potty I don't see any way how they're they're gonna get over that. I mean, okay, so I get up with my dogs at 5 a.m. and Gambit, right, our puppy, he whines, right, because he's gotta wake up and go, but I don't take him outside. He goes on a puppy pad. But I have to take him with everybody else, otherwise he would get so upset right? Because he's like, don't leave me behind. So I take him with everybody else, but I've got the puppy pad right out there. And then I have him go on the puppy pad. So sometimes when they're really young, you just gotta, you gotta make it work. Oh Lord. I think she just said the puppy is 60 pounds. Hang on. Let me scroll down. The puppy is 60 pound, 10 month old and one is a 63 pound two year old, the leash is standard length. Okay, yeah, so your puppy's old enough. I, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Just get them each on a short leash and take them out at the same time. I mean, first thing in the morning, they gotta go. They gotta go. Um, the other thing you can do is look into, hey Crystal, the other thing you could do is look into, um, you know, getting them some leash training, right? Working with a trainer, that can help a lot. But yeah, I don't, I don't see the, the puppy being able to hold it. And if you're trying to keep them from, you know, waking up 
other people in the house. You just got to take them out there together. So I would look into some, maybe check on YouTube and see if there's some, some training videos or something that might be able to help you. I'm sorry, I'm not more help on that. Okay, Simon said, thank you so much for your input. You're very welcome. I don't let him jump off high things. Good. I don't let him use the stairs. Good. But the dog park is informative. Okay. Yes, I've taken the dog school trainers watching monitoring. Good. All of that is good. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of trainers are now offering puppy classes. Not so much puppy classes in that you go and like teach your dog to sit right not that kind of puppy class but like a, a puppy party sometimes they'll call them where basically it's a safe place where puppies can all come and play and you've got trainers there that are kind of um mediating the playtime, right so that could be something to look into as well kathy said ally where have you been you look fabulous with your hair down hope you're okay hey Kathy thank you yeah um you know life it's been so busy we've been so busy so it's it seems like you ever have those months where it's just like one thing after another after another after another I feel like I haven't had a weekend to get things done I still have so much that I have to unpack just from moving, which was months ago, it's life. But I'm good. I'm good. And thank you, by the way. Simon said, so much research. I've lost sleep over my pub. I don't know if I can get it in my country. Oh, you're in Japan. Okay. I saw your post on this before, but I couldn't find it. Maybe I'll try to find some of the similar ingredients. Okay, so um, some of the other options that you can look for that will be good, um, look for, and I don't have my supplements in here with me, look for um, a 369 supplement. It's usually going to be an oil, like um, a herring oil or a sardine oil, or you could even add sardines to your puppy's food which would be great, another great way to um, add fresh food into the diet. Just make sure if you get canned sardines that they're canned in water and not in oil or something else. Um, look for green-lipped muscle powder. Um, usually it's, you know, a dog supplement, so you'll find it uh, online somewhere. So that would be another good option that you can use. Um, you can do a glucosamine and chondroitin. You just wanna make sure that it's a relatively low dose. So, and if you need help, if you find something that's available in your country and you want me to take a look at it, just let me know. I'll be happy to help you. Okay. Hey, Loretta joined us. How long would you recommend feeding satin balls? I fed my boy hamburger mixed with egg earlier in his kibble. He ate it all except the kibble. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for how long you feed the satin balls, that's really going to depend on the reason why you're feeding them. So are you feeding them for your dog to gain weight? Are you feeding them, um, you know, to try to mix into the food to get them to eat more? It really just depends on uh, what your what your reason for feeding them, and that kind of stipulates how long you're going to do it. Okay. Okay, great. You're very welcome, Simon. All right. Okay, guys. Well, I hate to jump in here and then run, but I'm going to have to jump off of here because I heard Sue's come home, so we're going to get some dinner and get started on some stuff we have to do tonight but um i just wanted to jump on here and see if i could help some people out thank you for joining on the friday night live and we're gonna start doing these um a lot more uh frequently so if you didn't get your question answered today if you're watching the replay then no worries um you can always post them in the comments and I'll jump on there or you can catch us in the next live session. 
So as always, be kind, rewind.